<laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Should we go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's a job. Can it walk? Make no, it walk broke. It. Oh, oh. No. Try not to knock this down. <laughs> okay. We're done. I shut it off. We'll see you. <laughs> Okay, before we get started, remember the Sunday, we have a review session. What time? Six. 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 And barbecue at 5.30. Yes. Let's see who's here. I'm no good sure. people. Barbecue. On the field up there. I don't know if it's out of whack because we have people from all three periods here. Okay, Sunday at 6. And I do have a, one thing to give you before you go. And then other than that, let's go ahead and finish off there. We should be right done with the election of 1964. Everybody here now seen the great commercial. Is that right? Yeah. The very subtle pro Johnson commercial. Johnson won and you know, a sweeping mandate. But the issue was he wanted this great society. He had grand goals. You know, get as many bills passed as possible, then move on. But Vietnam. Vietnam was always there. The South Vietnamese government was just barely holding on. And so, I want to hide it, push it down, somehow to make it seem like he's going to win. And then it all exploded. In, July, in January and February, there were huge Viet Cong attacks on bases. The biggest one was the base of Play Coup. Play Coup in central Vietnam, it would be one of these incredibly important cities right up to the very end in 1974. This is the attack on Play Q. It's a mortar attack. Very destructive. Destroyed over 20 American planes that were there helping the Viet Cong. Killed 17 Americans. And with this, I'm going to keep walking back right into the camera. That's going to be really creepy for whoever watches this. <laughs> I should probably move. For the Viet Cong. Yeah, it was in South Vietnam. But Americans were killed. And Johnson was under intense pressure to do this. So while this is happening in Vietnam, remember, nothing happens in a vacuum. Is that better? Okay. It's easy for you. The issue of voting rights. Remember the Civil Rights Bill passed. Well, the Civil Rights Bill did not deal with voting. And Johnson wanted to, okay, we got the Civil Rights Bill. Give me time, and I'll get the Voting Rights Act. No. No. The civil rights movements, we want the right to vote. This is not enough. We're going to keep pushing. And one more big event happened. Malcolm X, who you have now read about, but that's Malcolm X right there. That's actually during, during the debate for the Civil Rights Act in 64. He actually thought Martin Luther King was not doing enough. Malcolm X, a tireless fighter for equality, he at first wanted more separatists separate blacks from whites. He thought whites can never be trusted. He began to evolve, but he was assassinated. And this happened all during this time. And when Malcolm X was assassinated, combined with the demand for voting rights, it was, well, it's going to force Johnson to act. This is a march, and we'll get to this march in a second, but there is a march in Alabama that also happened for voting rights, and the police went out and attacked it with brutality, sick dogs on the marchers. And Johnson had to act. And Johnson would make the decision that they forced him, we need a Voting Rights Act. And when he decided for this, he knew one very important thing. If Johnson pushed for a Voting Rights Act, the Democratic Party is, at least as he knew it, is dead. Southern whites will leave the Democratic Party, which is exactly what happened. He decided, though, it's worth it. I have to do this. And they're making me do it. So, how does he do it? He does the uh, LBJ treatment. Yes. <laughs> and bombs North Vietnam. No. Um. To his point of view, I must look tough on Vietnam. And so, after these attacks, he, they ordered an attack on North Vietnam. This would evolve into the longest sustained bombing campaign in history. Operation Rolling Thunder. This is going to be bombing, not of the South, where the Civil War was, 
but the North, who was aiding the Viet Cong, much like the United States was aiding the South Vietnamese government. And this would go on for four years. And the thought was, if we bomb a few targets in the North, Ho Chi Minh will realize it's not worth it, quit. And so, Rolling Thunder, that's, this is actually a, a, a picture from 68 of an F-4, but it's going to be a sustained bombing. It was not going to be like carpet bombing. They thought we could bomb a few targets, convince the North we mean business. They totally miscalculated. They wanted unification. They saw this as a continuation, continuation of the fight against the French. And so this was never going to go anywhere. But to Johnson's point of view, now you can't say I'm losing Vietnam. I can get voting rights passed. I can get it done. And right after that, remember I mentioned the march? There was another one. Selma to Montgomery. There was two of these marches. And thousands came out to march. This is in Alabama, George Wallace country. And I like this picture because that's... Um, this is uh, um, um, Randolph, who's head of the NAACP, and I just like he's reading the paper every March. That's, that's a great picture. This time, Johnson sent federal marshals to protect them, and they forced the federal government to get involved here. It's a big deal. So this is all happening at the same time. Johnson isn't thinking, i got to go to Vietnam. Hey, there's something else going on. No, it's he's thinking, I hate Vietnam. I don't want to go there, but I feel like I have to. We know Johnson's feeling is pretty good because he recorded all his telephone conversations. You can listen to it, and they're painful. He knows Vietnam is bad. He's just hoping somehow he could finesse it, maybe enough to win. So it makes it like a, even a bigger tragedy because you can hear it go on. So here's the issue. If you have airstrikes, you need more airfields. If you have airfields, the Viet Cong are going to attack. And they said, well, we need troops. So in March of 64 or 65, Marines were sent in. Da Nang was first. Da Nang is on the shore. It would become one, the second most important base outside of Saigon right there. Marines hit the beaches. It was a big deal. They'll hit the beaches like they're invading. They were met by pretty young Vietnamese girls handing out candy and flowers. It's kind of a surreal experience. But now the US troops are there. They were to guard bases, but you can imagine the Marines are. The Viet Cong are coming in lobbing melt mortars, and they're saying, we got to go get them. So pretty soon they started going out and attacking. You start going out and attacking, they start taking more casualties. You take more casualties, and you're coming up to a choice. Are we going to pull back then, because we're taking casualties? Or are we going to send more troops and knock out the guys attacking us? And you can imagine what the Marines on the ground are saying. We can go get them. Just let us go. Turn us loose. Give us more men. And so once, it's like the, it's the horrible logic of escalation. Advisors. Advisors weren't winning. We'll send more. Pretty soon advisors are getting killed. Still not winning. So we'll start bombing. Bombing, we have to defend the airfields. We'll send troops. Troops, well, we've got to go get the guys attacking. So we've got an attack. And now we're coming to a point. Johnson needs his Voting Rights Act passed. The Great Society. But what about Vietnam? Johnson, this is the moment. This is a moment. And this is a defining moment for American history. Because the divide from this moment is still all over the United States. It's still divisive to this day. And my guess is as long as you live, the divide from here will still be with us. Johnson decided, or has a decision to make, if I escalate, it's full-scale war. But if I pull out, they might accuse me of being soft on communism. He should have said, what he should have done is declare victory. We won and go home. He got 61% of the vote. He's pretty popular. He probably would have been fine. But he, he couldn't admit defeat. So as he's making this decision, he goes to his advisors. Every high level advisor except one. Every one of his major foreign policy advisors say, we can win. We can win. Go. Only one. His Joint Chiefs of Staff said, go, even though they said, it's going to take 500,000 troops. It might take years. But they all said we could win. Every one. And Johnson was kind of awed by their Ivy League diplomas. You know, Johnson actually was a smarter guy. But he was a little bit in awe of them. 
even though he'd want to humiliate them. I'll tell you these stories later. And so, what Johnson did is, he agreed with him. This was easier. To him, it was took less courage to go to war than to pull out. It's always easier, though, to send someone else to die than you. Rolling Thunder was attacking North Vietnam, but the name was in the South. Remember, the Civil War is in the South. But the thought is, if we attack North Vietnam, they'll quit supporting the group Viet Cong. But what's going to happen is that's going to widen the war. And so Johnson has this decision to make. And all of them say go. The most important is Lard Hair Man, Robert McNamara. That's a great shot of him talking about South Vietnam. Remember the brill cream? Got a brill cream to slip back her hair? So Johnson called him his lard hair man. <laughs> he was the most widely respected man in Washington, D.C. And McNamara believed. And he had calculations, mathematical formulas. He was that type of guy. He thought, if we hit these targets in North, they'll quit. That's all we need to do. If we show the North, we mean business. And with McNamara pushing it and pushing it, remember, he lied about the Tonkin Golf incident. Pushing and pushing, they went. So McNamara is one of these guys you need to know. There have been questions about McNamara. He's going to become an intensely polarizing figure. Later on, he would try to kind of hide away from what he did. But he was all for it then. And Johnson believed him. So, please be the right. Johnson, in June of 65, while the debate for the Voting Rights Act is going on and other great society programs, Johnson would commit forces. He would make a very casual announcement. Johnson would just simply say, I'm sending the first air mobile division and other forces need air cap. These are the reasons he did it. And it's, okay, we got the credibility in Europe. That was always around. But the biggest reason, save the great society. I made a mistake here. I thought I'd move this down to the bottom. This was supposed to be, but. <laughs> This is the reason, this is the reason, this is the reason, and then this is going to be but. <laughs> but he, so saved the great society, but it's also JFK's legacy. The man LBJ hated and feared the most was no Republican, it was Robert Kennedy. <coughs> he thought Robert Kennedy would get into the race. And if LBJ wasn't tough on Vietnam, Robert Kennedy would hammer him with that. And, Kennedy, and Johnson did not want to be the mistake between the Kennedys. He was terrified of that. So, Save Great Society and JFK's legacy, because JFK made Vietnam important. And then, the credibility issue. But, it was going to cost so much money, he was going to keep the cost secret. Not only in money, but in men, to save the Great Society. And that is the great contradiction. He's going to keep it secret. Americans were not prepared. He implied it'll be a minor operation. They purposely did not call out the National Guard. They did not call out the reserves, because that would really impact families, unlike today. They're going to do it all with draftees. So they'll pull young men out. The idea being they don't have families yet and won't be as disruptive. Boy, were they wrong. And that was the thought. And the cost, they shifted budgets around, hid things took money that should have went to Great Society programs and secretly put it in the defense. And so, here's the issue. Not only is the whole Vietnam policy doomed, the Great Society is doomed. It's doomed. This will doom the Great Society. All of Johnson's plans, some would happen, but never be what he wanted. And so, slow, once Johnson committed forces, escalation began. And Johnson implied a few forces and we'll go quick. But the Army told them, it doesn't work that way. We need to build forces up slowly. Build it up. We can't just simply just send men in. And so Johnson knew going in and lied that it would be quick. Lied it would be cheap. Johnson treatment. He thought, I could tell whatever I want. We'll get the good. We'll get the right policy. They would not have really full-scale operations until 67, 68. And that's when they have enough troops. And so it's going to take a while. The people were not ready. So it seemed to work. Three laws were passed, all right after he sent troops. 
I've got to write one down, and it's the biggest one. But the Voting Rights Act did pass. There's Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act. So now there can be no more illit or literacy tests. The grandfather clause is gone. This is a big case. But not only that, two of the most important laws for the Great Society were passed. One I put down, Medicaid. And Medicaid is a pretty complex, it, there's a lot of flaws in Medicaid. But the goal is health insurance, state and federal health insurance for uh, lower income people. Even though you know it gets about 45% of all Medicaid money, the elderly. So it's actually kind of an old age thing. The other one I forgot to write down, hey, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare. And Medicare is a lot like Social Security. The government will become the health insurance provider for the elderly. And this has been, it's actually the, the, now the cheapest and most efficient part of our healthcare industry, Medicare. Because it can tamp down prices. It, there's some flaws in it, but we all pay about just under 2% of our, of our uh, income goes into a Medicare. A little bit like Social Security, it's come out with a payroll tax. This is all income. And this provides health care. Health care prices in the private section are skyrocketing so high that it's driving Medicare up. And so we're going to have to deal with that sometime down the road. They did a little bit, helped out a little bit in 2010. But there is Johnson signing Medicare. That's with President Truman, who's still alive, who wanted health care for everybody, got elderly. About, so about, 50% of all Americans are under some kind of national health care insurance. He got a pass. So Vietnam seemed to work. And there are great society programs going up everywhere. At the same time, the Supreme Court was very energetically pushing for, for equal rights. Very energetically pushing. I'll give you a second. These are some of the most important cases Oh, so naturally, if you're pushing for equal rights, more rights for people, elements that did not want equal rights immediately hated Earl Warren. Where's Warren at? Right there. There were sites to impeach Earl Warren all over the country. He became a very polarizing figure. But these court cases would be incredibly important. Engel versus Vital basically said that, or um, said that the federal government could make sure that uh, legislative districts were not gerrymandered to help certain groups, were not shaped in a way to help, let's say, elect one person or another. Big decision, because this was the norm. Make sure that legislative districts, legislative districts. They would, it was pretty common to make a legislative district and, and make it very weird borders so they could you know, get one person elected. That's called gerrymandering. Did I say Engel versus Vital for that one? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's not Engel versus Vital. That's Baker versus Carr. That's Baker versus Carr. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Just Engel versus Vital is no school prayer. You, okay, you can pray in school. You can be praying right now. But there can be no organized school prayer. They can't come over and say, now let's do the prayer. And they would do the prayer. This was standard practice in school. And Engel versus Vital said, no, you can't have a school-sponsored prayer. Of course that doesn't mean you can't pray on your own. How would I know? <laughs> or care. You know, that's a, your own reason. But the idea is you can't make you do a school prayer. Yeah. Is this kind of like the one like where they wouldn't let you say the Pledge of Allegiance because it's like God, under God, well, God? That that is this court case, but that's the establishment clause. Because does that does that mean if you say under God, is that giving us um, is that having a state sponsored religion? Because that is unconstitutional. Gideon versus Wainwright. You know what Gideon is? You must have a lawyer. It says in the Constitution that attorneys will be provided 
And so states have different rules on that, but a lawyer must be provided. Miranda versus Arizona, everybody who is convicted of a crime must be aware of their rights. They must be aware of their rights. And it's after that that it's if you Miranda all watch rights. police shows, Miranda. what do they all read them? Miranda rights. That's where it comes from. Nice. They don't have to read them, but they do that so they make sure we know they know the rights. Technically, they don't have to. Uh, this is one of the most, this is a really important case for, for women. Because, well, I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to that on Monday. Griswold versus Connecticut. Women can have birth control. This was an important issue for women's rights. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I your way? <laughs> I'm wearing a white shirt. Joe DiMaggio's team. You know who Joe DiMaggio is? Does anybody? Thank you. The great DiMaggio. Remember I mentioned Thurgood Marshall, who was the first, the, the first African American on the Supreme Court? I know the picture. <laughs> they, they all look like they've been painted, <laughs> painted with latex paint. <laughs> they all have the same face, but that's Thurgood Marshall right there. The Marshall Court. But don't they all look at me like someone just went, ah, let's make you all the same color. Kind of a weird gray thing. So Baker versus Carr, that was the redistricting one. They, they, they can go through and make sure that legislative districts are, are fair. I just, hmm? they call it redistricting, but it, they made sure that legislative districts were fair. Marshall, he's the first African American. And I just put up there so I could point him out. But this is important to understand. There's so many things going on. And so, well, you have the Warren Court. You have, now, the Great Society, all these bills passed, and the poverty was actually being reduced, and it looked like, on the short run, wow, we're going to really solve our problems. Vietnam is raging. That is the commander of American forces, General William Westmoreland. By the way, as the military went into an unpopular war near the end, the medals got bigger. You can always tell an unpopular war when they all started getting lots of medals because that's the way they try to increase morale. Here's a medal. You were there. There's a medal. I'm only slightly exaggerating. And Westmoreland's strategy was called search and destroy. This is actually, these are tunnel rats. The, once the Viet Cong realized that the Americans meant business, they hid in tunnels. There was an array of tunnels they would send these guys down. It's not something you want to volunteer for, to go through these tunnels to find the Viet Cong. I'm not going to go all the details of this, but search and destroy strategy was simple. Can you see me now? <laughs> Did you all get in the picture? Come on. No one moved. <laughs> Can they just take like handguns? Wait, 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 here we go. Vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's going to be great seeing me walk back to the camera when I hit the screen every time. I like that. Search and destroy was this. Viet Cong tactics, guerrilla tactics, were hit and run, attack, um, attack lightly defended targets, supply lines, and then go off into the jungle whenever heavily armored American soldiers would come. So how are the Americans going to deal with it? Westmoreland thought, common strategy, OK, we'll go out in the jungle. And I'm giving you the basic idea. Send relatively small American soldiers on search and destroy units, or search and destroy missions, hoping that what happens to them? They get attacked. They get attacked. They get ambushed. They're ambush bait. Ew. That's not good for morale. It's hard. And they go through the jungle, then someone fires at you, and this idea is, they're there! And then you use the superior American firepower to blow that area away, hoping they'll hit something. That's the strategy. They were used with huge units or small units. But the idea was, find them and use American firepower. And that was the strategy. And it was ineffective immediately. Oh, sure, they killed a lot of Viet Cong. But the problem was this. Once America started sending troops in, who else started sending troops in? China. No. China. North Vietnam. North Vietnam was just sending advisors to help the Viet Cong. Once the US started sending troops, 
the Akong came in. And they came in, this is not on a slide, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, what we called it. Irregular trails soon become a road network through neutral Laos and Cambodia, and then built their supplies in the South Vietnam. And they always had a sanctuary. They could fight and then flee into the north, flee into Laos. And Laos and Cambodia. And the other part of this, this is one of the more famous pictures from the Vietnam War. And so what the United States would use then is intense bombing when they know the enemy are. And these are victims of a napalm attack. These are South Vietnamese villagers that just happened to be there when the, this is US and South Vietnamese planes dropped napalm on her village. Her clothes were burned off. You know, this is in black and white. She is in agony running down the road as her village burns in the background by a napalm attack. And the problem was this. Firepower, killing. Bombs can't tell if you're Viet Cong or not. They just explode. I know that sounds stupid, but think about it. Remember the Southern strategy in the Revolutionary War, where the British roll through the South. Same thing. Someone fires at them, they destroy a village. The survivors become what? Enemies. Huh? Enemies. Enemies. This helped the Viet Cong. In fact, the Viet Cong would encourage this almost. They would purposely, I mean, this is a horrible type of war, but they would purposely try to attack from villages, knowing that the Americans would blow it away. Then, the people who survived would hate the Americans. Oh, there, there's nobody saintly in this fight. Everybody is, this is an evil type of war. And so, both sides are doing it. And there's heavily jungle. This is Operation Ranch Hand, and this is something you do need to know. Guess what they're dropping on the forest? Forest, you can't see the enemy, right? Let's drop a dead, deadly herbicide called Agent Orange on it. We'll kill the forest, find the enemy. Yes, it's going to cause horrible birth defects, cancer, and kill hundreds of thousands on American, South Vietnamese, well, not Vietnamese, anybody who's in the way. I mean, this was just, it was just a really haphazard, ham-handed way of fighting, especially for an army that was trained to fight Soviet tanks or a nuclear war. So what was Operation Dropping Agent Orange, which is a horrific herbicide. It's illegal now. Well, in the US. Mexico, they still drop it. Agent Orange. This would be a big deal. The US tried to act like nothing happened. But in the 1980s, finally, since there were thousands of American soldiers that were suffering horribly from Agent Orange, they finally acknowledged it. And so you have these kind of things. How would you know you're winning? Body counts. They would just don't count how many people you kill. How do you know how many people you kill? You just guess. Yeah. You see a dead body? That's one. But there's blood there. Two. Uh, I see equipment. Three. Four. You know, say what well, they would go through and count. See, we've killed this many, and you can imagine what, what happens. They would go from the front line and they get to an officer. Officer, like, we killed three. I don't get a promotion. It's thirty. Then we go to Saigon. We killed three hundred. That's exactly what would happen. That's why I have the Alice in Wonderland picture here. <laughs> the reporters started calling the briefings where they would give the body counts as it was kind of Alice in Wonderland. They would say one thing and they go out in the field and say it's nothing at all like this. We're not killing them. They call the noon press briefing in Saigon the, the noon follies because they knew they were being lied to, just constantly lied to. Yes, they called it the same thing in Baghdad, in Kabul, Kabul today. The same thing. And then they came up with a kill ratio. We killed so many of them, they only killed this many of us. Victory. And then on TV, you have a little relatively sanitized version. They show little things. The media, for the most part, was pro-war, very pro-war. But the pictures, even when they were edited, are anti-war. War, by definition, is anti-war. When you see pictures of dead bodies, see pictures of villages being burned and civilians being forced away from their villages, put into encampments, it's not pretty. War is anti-war. Why do you think they censor it so heavily today? Why do you think they won't even show 
flag draped coffins coming home today because war is anti-war. When people realize the cost, if they don't know the cost, and so there's going to be this big thing against the media. But actually, the media, the reports were pretty anti or pretty pro-war. The pictures were anti-war. And then Johnson kept on saying, as the war and the casualties got bigger and bigger and bigger. OK, it's, he would say things like, there's a gradual victory, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. We are killing more of them. We are winning. It's happening. By 67, we had killed twice as many Viet Cong as there actually were. That's victory. How does that work? Huh? Lying. So many enemies, they just... No, they just, we lied. No. Just make it up stuff. You know, they see an area that's hit by napalm. There must have been 50 people in there. So that was Johnson's thing. Yeah. The light at the end of the tunnel. So there are a lot of political cartoons of light at the end of the tunnel being a train. <laughs> but Johnson, at least early on, Okay, he would go to Washington, Don Powell. There's Johnson. He still was earthy, popular. I mean, he had something about him. But as the war would go on, it would change. I just find that picture funny of him giving puppies. It looks like a scared child. <laughs> Here's a basket of dogs. <laughs> and that's little Beagle Johnson one. And there's his dogs. He got in trouble. He, thought he got accused of being cruel to dogs when he's holding up the dog by his ears. To show you how paranoid he was because of the war, he'd say, that's a communist plot, accusing me of being cruel to dogs. Beagles like that. <laughs> and Johnson, though, he had a heart attack when he was in the Senate. So he had gallbladder surgery. And people thought, oh, Johnson's having another heart attack. This is in 66. So he liked to show off his scar, because first off, he's Johnson, and that's what Johnson does. But also, this proof it wasn't a heart attack. So he had a 16-inch long scar that was still leaking that he showed <laughs> reporters. And ah, everyone's kind of laughing. Maybe the best political cartoon of the war would come out of that. <laughs> oh, God. What's the scar? Yeah. Isn't that a great cartoon? I think that's very clever. Because even though Nobody the majority of people might not have liked the war, they were supporting it, they were supporting Johnson's Great Society, there was an undercurrent of, the only way to describe it was unease, anger over the war. The anti-war movement began to grow and Johnson suffered. Johnson pained over everybody. He would personally sign every letter of every man who died. 25,000 Americans. He hated it. And so in private, he never slept. He would just kind of walk around the White House and think about this. And then in public, he'd say the war is going well. It's a tragedy in many ways. And the anti-war movement, okay, this is an anti-war. Vietnam, you know, see modern atrocities in full color, you know, things like that. That's an anti-war poster I just thought was rather amusing. And as the war goes on, this is an anti-war poster showing that's what really happened to the Great Society. It's, it's not, that's actually a pretty creepy one, isn't it? And anti-war protests begin to grow, especially a group called the Students for a Democratic Society. And the Students for a Democratic Society are also called the New Left. And they were pushing for even more New Deal-like programs. They were. You would call them democratic socialists. They're not quite socialists, but they're, their vision was something like Sweden. It was hard to become Sweden because we don't happen to be Sweden. But they were intensely anti-war, and they were the leaders in the anti-war movement. That's an anti-war protest in 1966. And you'll notice something about the anti-war protesters. The pro-war people called hawks would paint the anti-war movement as being a bunch of hippies and drug addicts. No, they weren't. Clean cut, a cross section from society, all ages were against the war. But the pro-war people painted the anti-war people. Anti-war people, if the hawks are pro-war, the anti-war are? Doves. Doves. They painted them as hippies and drug addicts. For a democratic society. 
and they want civil rights, uh, they want end poverty. So like, expanded great society, but also intensely anti-war. One of the biggest ones in 1967, 40,000 anti-war protesters came to the Pentagon. McNamara had soldiers who had no bayonets, no bullets in those rifles, but they had end piece outside the Pentagon. I like this one, they're putting flowers in. <laughs> it was a very surreal moment. I mean, actually, it was no confrontation. Uh, really, though. This is actually from 71. You can tell 71 because the hair is getting longer as the years go by. But other than that, it's a very much a cross-section of society against the war. And this was a growing as more casualties came in. And it was clear there was not going to be a quick victory. As it was clear that more money is going to the Vietnam War, the anti-war protests grew. And starting in 65, the time of the Lot Hong Summer. The first big one was in Watts, but Detroit and Newark had other horrible ones. These, this is Watts, uh, that's Detroit, that's Watts. Inner city, blacks, who they were called the ghetto back then, it just seems weird to think about, no one ever calls it that today. It was just routine that they'd be harassed by the police, they had pretty horrible jobs. The unemployment rate was three or four times higher in these areas as it is today. You know, pretty horrific. And the thing was this, all these civil rights advancements, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, didn't change how horrible their life was in, let's say, Los Angeles. And when expectations go up, but they're not met, it leads to rage. And there were these riots all over. And it, it, there's no logic to it. It does not help get more rights, it's just rage. But the point is this, this went everywhere. And it gave the appearance that the whole country was falling apart. And by 67 in Watts, I'm sorry, in Newark, the police are using snipers to basically just kill every young black man they see. We're just gunning them down. It was like civil war in the country. They gave that order. I mean, I actually didn't, I didn't know that until I read that in Nixonland and I looked at it, oh my God. That's Watts, that's Newark, that's a young man, 14, gunned down by the police. I mean, that sniper just picking people off. This was shocking and it was happening right here. And so I was a little bit behind when I showed you Nixon the once I was gone, but does that make sense now how they're able to use that divide and law and order? Because then they got these people who were well, living the American dream, and they see this happening in their own country. That's why law and order meant we're going to crack down on them. It, it was a nasty time. At the same time, the civil rights movement was growing, changing. <laughs> and there were more and more people that believed it isn't enough. We have to fight back. The beginning of the black power movement began to grow. And black consciousness was an important part about this. And black consciousness, at the beginning, I, I, I won't deny it. I think, it's a, I think it's really good what happened out there. Good. Because there was this feeling in the United States, and it still exists, that black was negative. And you still see that today. You know, if you think about what's evil, they're black, they're dark, and they're in the shadows. Good in the light, they're white. And you see that all over. All good things were white. Negative was black. Blacks were told from day one, you're not as smart. You're not going to go as far. Don't bother taking those hard classes. In fact, we're not going to allow you to take them all. And what black consciousness meant, no. Black was, they like to say, black is beautiful. But the whole point is, Black is good as anybody else. Yeah, this was a real issue. And I can't comprehend how it would feel to, to be on that other side. I think, I think girls can, boys can, white boys can. Because we never had that. Girls have that. I'll talk about that a little more later. Girls were told, nah, you can't do that. You're a girl. Yeah. Obviously, that's still around. I'll tell you a little more about that on Monday. But it was different. 
And it, but what started out as that turned into pretty confrontational against whites who said, why? Now Johnson would pull out a list of all the bills he passed and say, why are you mad at me? I got you these bills passed. And he's like, well, you don't understand. Racism has been around a long time. You know, it just was very confusing. When the most vocal spokesman was an articulate man by the name of Stokely Carmichael. Great speaker. I could see him rallying on people. He, he had a gift. Stokely. Did that put Stokey? No, it's Stokely. Oh, good. <laughs> Stokey. <laughs> well, wit and Stokey. No, it's, but still, light at the end of the tunnel, there's Johnson with the dog. But the point is, that's actually the Viet Cong bodies piled up after this Tet Offensive. But the point is, Johnson really began to push a lot of the end of the tunnel. He was told, going into 67, he said, you got to convince people we're winning. And they won this massive public relations campaign by the end of 67 to tell everybody, we're winning the war. We're winning. We're winning. We're winning. It's going to happen. We're winning. Please be the right slide. And then all hell broke loose. This is hard for me. I really know the Vietnam War, so I want to tell, I keep on thinking I should tell about this battle. No, we, we got a lot of stuff to cover. The Tet Offensive. On the Vietnamese New Year, which was always a truce, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese did a massive attack. And we're not, don't worry about the Ho Chi Minh or the Siege Khe Son. <coughs> I'm not going to tell you about that. But they, on the Japanese New Year, they did a massive attack on every single, every single uh, provisional capital, on Saigon, on Way, virtually every American military base. They attacked everywhere in a surprise attack. Many of the South Vietnamese soldiers were on leave. Um, there would be fireworks and celebrations for New Year's Eve, and they thought, perfect time. What the Viet Cong thought is this would trigger an uprising. Then the South Vietnamese would overthrow their, their, their was corrupt government. Well, that didn't happen at all. The U.S. Viet Cong were taken, for the most part, by surprise, but fought back. Actually, the South Vietnamese, this was the best their army fought. And eventually, the Viet Cong was destroyed in virtually every battle. Militarily, this is one of the biggest victories for the U.S. and the South Vietnamese in the entire war. But the problem was this. Johnson had been going around the country saying, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. It doesn't look like victory if they're able to attack every city in the South. No, that was the Viet Cong attacking the South. Okay. The Viet Cong attacking South Vietnamese cities. Remember, this is a civil war. And we're not going to talk about Khe Sanh. They even attacked the U.S. Embassy. A suicide attack on the U.S. Embassy. Well, actually, it turned out to be a suicide attack. A few were taken prisoner. There were television scenes of uh, fighting within the U.S. Embassy. They were all killed, but it doesn't look, or killed or taken prisoner. That was Viet Cong right there taken prisoner. So much smaller. <clears throat> Saigon was actually turned into what they call the free fire zone. And American helicopter gunships were actually shooting anything that moved in a city of four million people. And this was chaos. And out of this comes one of the most famous pictures of the war. The South, the Saigon police chief gunning down a suspected Viet Cong guerrilla. What proof did he have? Don't care. This is actually the embassy photographers there. So we only have an AP photo, snap the picture. There's a film. This is on film. And he just kind of walks and bang, shoots him. Ball, blood everywhere. No, I'm not going to show you that. But. I'm sure you've seen this picture before. The point is this. We're saying it's victory. That doesn't look like victory. The Tet Offensive turned everything around. Public opinion was mostly for the war. About 60-40, according to a Gallup poll in January before the offensive. It's not that the 60% all liked the war. It was more like that 60% were like, well, we're there. Let's just finish it. Two months after Tet, it reversed completely. 44, 60 against. 
And Johnson, who looked like, okay, he'll win re-election, might be tight, everything changed. Because this is an election year. Remember what I told you, every 36 years is a key election, 1932, 1968. This is the election that came out of the Vietnam War. Our divided country today, once again, we live in Montana, so, <laughs> but our divided country today, 68. This is where it comes from. It's a presidential election year. Oh, this is uh, the New York Times talking about that. And Westmoreland said, we won. We need more troops. If you won, why do you need more troops? Yeah. Yeah, actually, the Viet Cong was destroyed. The Viet Cong was devastated. This was actually America's biggest victory. And on the field, tactical, strategic, horrific loss for the U.S. Oh, I already told you that. <laughs> so, in 1968, because of this, Lyndon Johnson shocked the world and dropped out of the election. Now, you have to understand something. Lyndon Johnson was a giant. No American president well power as much as him. And he dropped out. And so, with that, we get the years of the election. Um, we're not going to talk about Clean Jean. He came out against the war and did well in North... And, but this is the guy we have to get. Robert Kennedy entered the race. And when that happened, Kennedy implied he was going to get the country out of war, a little bit like Nixon did, but Kennedy entered the race. And when that happened, Johnson was furious and bailed. But then in April, 1968. We saw this in the video. In Memphis, Tennessee, supporting a, a garbage worker strike, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Who killed him? James Earl Ray. Why is it that assassins have three names? All right, before you go, I'm stopping recording. We'll finish the rest of this on Monday. Sunday, I'm very excited to see all of you, and I have a gift for you as you leave. A package.